Bonjour, Anin, everyone. Hello, this is Annette Lee, and welcome to the Two-Eyed Seeing Ojibwe Astronomy and NASA Moon to Mars. We're going to do our best here for a live show, sharing content from our team, Carl Gaboy, William Wilson, our elders, Jeff Tibbetts, Jim Knutson Kalanzi, and myself, Annette Lee. So let's begin. Mitakwe Oyasin to all my relations. My name is Annette Lee. I am mixed race Lakota. My family name is Wambli Luta, Red Eagle. I'm speaking to you today from the land we call Mani Sota Makoche, the land where the water reflects the sky. I want to welcome you for being here and for all of us sharing this circle together to try to try to do something good, especially for our K through 12 students. I want to acknowledge that we're trying to create this good work during the worst of times, the COVID dark storm. We are all going through a hard time, a kind of a global trauma. I want to acknowledge all the people that have died over a million in the world on our planet Earth and over 200,000 here in the United States. Let's take a moment of silence for all those that have passed. So Jim Kay is gonna do the land acknowledgement, but I also wanna say a big thank you, Miigwech, to NASA Next Generation STEM for funding this project. And I wanted to tell you that we do have a series happening here. The series is based on our idea of two-eyed seeing. This comes to us from the Mi'kmaq tribe in Nova Scotia and our colleague, Kerala Nakwood. Two-eyed seeing, Epwaptamunk, means to learn to see with one eye from the strength in indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strengths of Western knowledge. And this is the key part, to use both eyes for the benefit of all. So that's what we're trying to do here. I want to let you know that there are seven live events in the series of Indigenous Astronomy. And we uh, are doing the first one today in October. And then November is Dakota Lakota, our team. And then the Maya Mesoamerican team in December and January, the Navajo team. And in February, the African African American team and so on. So I always want to personally invite you to come to each and every one um, as we create this together. Here is our uh, our funding, the funding for our project, and through this generous support, a NASA Fast Track Award, we're able to create this for you today. So with that, I would like to go to our team member, Jim Kay, who is going to do the land uh, acknowledgement. Hello, I am Anishinaabe. Jim Knutson Klodzny, a team member of the Native Sky Watchers program. Land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous people as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. Why do we recognize the land? To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory you reside on, and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land from time immemorial. It is important to understand the long-standing history that has brought you to reside on the land, and to seek to understand your place within that history. Land acknowledgments do not exist in a past tense, or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process, and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. It's also worth noting that acknowledging the land is an indigenous protocol. There are two types, there are two indigenous tribes located in Minnesota, Dakota and Anishinaabe. Minnesota Makoche Land Acknowledgement. Minnesota Makoche is the homeland of the Dakota people, land where water reflects the skies or clouds. Mini means water, soda means clear, but not perfectly so. Cloudy, Makoche means a place, land, or country. 
And according to the oral history, the Dakota originated in Minnesota Makoche. The Dakota Nation currently resides on four reservations in southern Minnesota. Our event would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on today is the original homelands of the Dakota. Anishinaabe land acknowledgement. In 1545, the Anishinaabe began settling in Minnesota, known as the Great Migration. Over the last 474 years, the Anishinaabe Nation has survived and they currently reside on seven reservations located in northern Minnesota. We acknowledge both the Dakota and the Anishinaabe's painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory. And we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to the land on which we gather. The reading of the land acknowledgement hopefully leads to a commitment to action. A good place to begin is to learn about the indigenous people who are here before you. Um, recognize the Dakota value of the Takaway Watson, which means we are all related. And understand we are all relatives and connected to each other. We have a relationship with all human beings, and with all things seen and unseen. This relationship extends to the land, to all things that exist on the land, in the air and in the water. We ask our schools, teachers, and students to go beyond recognizing and acknowledging um, this land that they're on and to consider action steps. Here are the few action steps that our schools are currently doing. Uh, recognition and display of the Fond du Lac Nation tribal flag. Establish and support the Indian Parent Committees. Recognizing the school is on land cared for and called home by the Boy Sport Tribal Nation. Providing American Indian students with opportunities to be successful. Establishing a cultural maple syruping space. Creating Ojibwe language signs to post around the school. Incorporating American Indian literature in the classroom. And learning from native culture how to be good stewards of the land on which we learn. And finally, take a few moments to reflect on these words. What does it mean to you to have a school on Indian land? How do you intend to do better for Dakota land on which we reside? I want to thank the Red Tree Drum Group for providing an honor song for the elders from which we learn. Miigwech. Miigwech, Jim. That was excellent. So now we're gonna go to a teaching shared by our elder Carl Gaboy about the Moose Constellation. This time of year, as soon as the sun sets and the stars come out and you can start seeing constellations, there's a real important one in the night sky and it becomes more important as the fall goes on. And if you look to the east, you'll see a big square of stars and it is big. It's really a, quite a large constellation. And as the fall goes on, each evening it rises higher and higher. And the ancient Greeks called that Pegasus. Uh, the Ojibwe called it the Great Moose. And it's a big square of stars. And that constellation was depicted on rock paintings. Now, I have to say something about the rock paintings. There's about 200 rock painting sites from Lake Superior to Hudson's Bay. And the Ojibwe and the Cree identify with those rock paintings as something that their ancestors have done. Eddie Benton and Basil Johnston and many other Ojibwe writers make this connection. Archaeologists tell us that the last rock paintings were done on the Laurentian Shield in 1850. And the oldest ones were done about a thousand years ago. So they mark a long time of recording Ojibwe knowledge. Now the rock paintings are knowledge. They're mnemonic devices so that the people who are trained looking at the rock paintings remember the oral tradition that goes along with them. And that also works with the constellations. 
when the Ojibwe who are familiar with the constellations look at their Ojibwe constellations that we have now put together on this map, those constellations become connected with a story, a myth. And then they also become connected with what's going on in the landscape, what you could call it uh, environmental, environmental systems. The word is called local knowledge. That is, if you have local knowledge, it means that you look at the stars and you look at the lakes and you look at the seasons and you look at animal behavior and it all kind of connects together. And you can explain what's going on in the environment. When the moose in the fall start to get aggressive and they start facing down hunters, and my goodness, a moose will even face down an automobile or a locomotive in the fall of the year, that's when you hunt moose because the moose kind of cooperate in this and present themselves to you. And the modern sportsman seasons have are located moose, the, the, locate their moose hunting season in the fall of the year for the same reason, for the same reason. The kind of wonderful thing about it is that the Ojibwe tradition says that as a constellation rises, it gains power. And finally, the constellation is directly overhead and Pegasus will be directly over our head around the 1st of November. And then as the year goes on, the constellation slowly slips past the zenith and starts slipping toward the west. And that's when the constellation loses power, according to Ojibwe tradition. Well, as it turns out, the moose and the environment go through the same process. As soon as winter sets in, the moose become skinnier. They lose their magnificent antlers. And as they slip down into the west like the constellation, they become weaker and it, it's not so important that you hunt them at that time because you just simply don't get all that you can out of the moose. It's the fall of the year is when they're fat and powerful and muscular and very aggressive. Now, what came first? The knowledge of the constellation or observing the moose in nature? I don't know. I don't know. It, but it's a wonder, isn't it? The, the, these pictographs that we see here are the most famous of the Ojibwe pictographs because they're so clear and well drawn. These are constellations. That big human figure there is Orion. The panther figure down below there is uh, Leo and Hydra, combination of those two constellations. But I'm here to talk about the moose. Now, notice that they aren't exact silhouettes that certain parts of the pictograph has been rubbed away. So notice on the moose, there are two spots where the heart should be. They have been, they've been rubbed clean. And notice also that the moose is kind of a squarish shape, just like Pegasus. Pegasus is this big square and when the Hegman Lake artist that did this moose uh, did did the moose uh, kind of in a square shape. Then also I should point out the bell of the moose. The bell is a uh, fat fur uh, at the throat of the moose that when you actually see a moose that hangs b below the throat. And that bell serves a function for the moose because wolves attacking moose will try to grab the throat, but instead they'll grab just the skin of fat and fur and be just thwarted from being able to get a good hold of the throat. So the, the Hegman Lake artist did this wonderful moose figure with the bell and with these two hearts. Now, if we look at the map of the constellations of Pegasus right here, notice that there are two stars where the heart would be in the square of Pegasus. 
and they are uh, tau pegasi and omega pegasi. Uh, these names are Latin names assigned to the stars according to their brightness in any given constellation. There actually is an old Arabic name for these stars too. But notice that the Hegman Lake artist put these stars in his rock painting. Uh, notice also the bell of the moose, um, where the, the, the two stars are. The uh, Hegman, Hegman Lake artist painted that. And then the constellation of Lacerta is the great antlers and the head and the snout of the moose. And you can see that uh, to the right of the great square. And, and as the autumn goes on, this constellation, which is a real big constellation, takes up a lot of the sky. By the time fall comes, it's almost directly overhead as soon as the sun goes down. And you can see all these parts of it. And this is a drawing that I did imitating the, 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 the rock painting. The, uh, uh, the, star, the stars marking the heart of the moose. And then that great square of Pegasus and the stars that are below that are the um, legs of the moose. So Carl, um, how long have you been uh, working on your uh, revitalization efforts for Ojibwe astronomy? I started looking at the Hegman Lake Rock paintings when I was in junior high school. At that time, everyone would talk about the rock paintings saying that they're mysterious and no one knows what they depict. No one knows why they were put on the rocks. And so I started wondering that too. Now, one of the things that we should keep in mind here is that this is what was called lost knowledge. 1850, remember, was what I said was the last of the rock paintings that were done on the Laurentian shield. There was a number of different reasons as to why they, the meaning of these were forgotten. And one was the forcible movement of people, of the Ojibwe people to reservations, the uh, boarding school era, the whole reservation period where being, a, being free to travel to the rock painting sites was actually prohibited so that this knowledge could not be continued on to the next generation. So it, it was lost knowledge. And I keep telling people that my knowledge of Ojibwe culture in terms of ceremony or legends or these things that make up culture uh, is not all that strong. I'm not fluent in the language, for example, but I'm pretty good at putting things together. And what I did was I started putting things together. Uh, constellations, rock paintings, and legends. And then I realized, and I woke up one time in the middle of the night, my eyes as big as saucers, and I said, my God, they're constellations. And so from then on, I started piecing everything together. And I should mention I had a lot of help. Uh, I had uh, a, a lot of Indian people, and it was almost like uh, a, a conspiracy it was done in secret. And I'd wish for them in secret. I think, and I'd say, I think I know what the rock paintings are. And I had real good friends who sat down and actually helped me, helped me put things together. Jeff, my name is Jeff Tippetts. I'm from Fond du Lac. 
from the Crane clan. I live here, uh, I've been living here all my life, but they uh, really glad to be here this morning. And I got a PowerPoint here I'm gonna um, try to uh, do here. Except my, uh, I can't get to my screen here. I don't know why this is doing this. But anyway, this is a picture. Can you? Muted me in that. Can you hear me now? You had muted me. Okay. I don't know if you heard my introduction or not, but there it is. Um, I'm Jeff Tibbetts. I'm from Fond du Lac. And this picture here uh, is uh, one my, my daughter Sophie took of uh, Lake Mille Lacs. And we were out on uh, netting. Um, netting uh, fish. So um, I don't know if you can see on the right side of this, we we're going out to um, um, set our nets or uh, check our nets. And the, right to the right of this picture is our nets, actually. Uh, and before I get started, I wanted to um, uh, kind of reflect more about what Jim had talked about, um, the history of the um, Native people and, and why something like this is maybe seen as um, uh, groundbreaking and new, but actually our knowledge has gone back, you know, thousands and thousands of years. But there is a, um, a attempt to, um, minimize and to uh, eradicate our languages, our knowledge, and um, our culture. So I'm hoping um, by having all the educators here today that they take note of um, trying to not only bring this uh, newfound knowledge or um, whatever, the culture, but also maybe the reasons why, why um, that had to be done because uh, some of the reasons I got listed on the right side there um, our, our knowledge was uh, purposefully minimized and tried to try to eradicate. But um, this is a picture of my dad right here. He went to boarding school and uh, boarding school is something that uh, was uh, one of those attempts to uh, get rid of our culture. So um, that's something that uh, part of my life. This is a place, um, if you can see here, this arrowhead, this is where I'm at, right? If you can see my cursor, it's right at the tip of this uh, Lake Superior. And this area here is uh, 1854 Cedar Territory. And this is where I do a lot of hunting hunting and um, fishing. So I just put this map up to show you some of um, the areas that that we um, seeded in our uh, treaties and also um, we retain the rights to hunt, fish and gather in these areas. This is a picture of, um, of a, a dissertation or a study that was done up a little bit. I think it was on Shoal Lake First Nation, but it's was called learning as you journey and right here it's um kind of a basic picture of, of the land and Jim had talked about um recognizing the land and and as you live on the land I mean you start learning about it and as a young person maybe in a kind of a small small way but as you get older and older I mean you learn about um purposes of that land and uh what the land kind of means to you and of course, we, we have our, uh, 
and just learning the language, but um, we, we have our own names for uh, these locations and uh, the uh, Zibi, the water, um, Minnes Island here. Um, so we've always had that too. So, and as you learn, um, I hunt and fish a lot and I do some sugar bushing, but um, you, you can start understanding the structure of the land and, and why it makes, um, uh, makes it good for doing these different things we do. And as you learn more and more, you see uh, like on this, this picture here, you can see like there's wild rice here and um, like at Fond du Lac, they actually tried draining our rice lakes on the early 20s and 30s. Um, I think, I don't know if it was for sure to make our, our life harder here, but also to, uh, to make it into farmland because a lot of the people didn't recognize how important the wild rice is to native people around here. And um, as you uh, take part in all these activities, you learn, you learn about where, where to do them and, and where, where the best bang for your buck is as far as uh, uh, what part of the lake you go to where it's usually thick or, or if uh, you're hunting, you know, this uh, area here might be good for um, um, pushing a deer through there. And maybe because it's been burned over, there's some fresh browse in there that deer will be hanging out or the moose. So um, you just kind of learn as you, as you go. So, and here's just a couple of pictures of um, some people. I got a picture of Carl Gaboy's um, picture right here in the middle of uh, some racers, wild racers. And uh, this is William on the left and me and my wife on the right. And um, one thing about the um, um, taking part in these activities are really uh, um, time sensitive. So there's only certain times you can, um, you have to go and, and do get the rice. There's certain times you have to um, make the maple syrup and maple sugar, and uh, you can't be um, you can't be late. So, and this is the bell of the moose, and um, uh, Carl talked a little bit about that. And for me, it was something that um, I had heard about. Uh, first, went hunting moose in the eighties, and I had heard about hanging the bell in the tree after taking a moose, and um, I didn't know why. I, I I just I did it, but I really didn't know the why, and um, I was just told to do it. So so I had done it, and it took me a long time to understand, you know, that uh, the reason why. And this is just a map of um, um, the native sky watchers, but I didn't know any of this stuff, you know, until several years ago, and. Uh, it really kind of changed my life learning about it because it was, uh, I was missing out on a whole big part of um, my existence. So in learning, learning about this, I call it relearning because uh, the knowledge is there and we just have to um, try to relearn it. And this is a, just a little, um, um, saying that that I like it's rock without ever looking back and I don't mean that um, by not recognizing the uh, history or the culture or um, the things that have gone before us I look at this as um, walk without ever looking back at what you may not know just keep walking forward and if you walk far enough that um, that knowledge will come to you so in kind of closing here, the, the relearning of um, our culture and the meanings behind maybe why we hang the bell in the, the tree, you know, to recognize the, the constellation up in the sky, you know, having that um, part of me back within me is, um, has made me a better person.
and it and it doesn't make me feel um, any smaller that that there's a whole big vast amount of knowledge that I have to learn, but it's it's made me feel uh, that I'm part of something bigger, and it's really helped me to grow in myself here on on the earth. So, so I think in that part, it's made me a, a better person. So, let's see here. So that's really um, kind of all I got as far as that goes. I, I enjoy, there's, there's people in the res here that are a lot more um, knowledgeable about different activities, you know, but for myself, just taking part in, part in them and uh, learning more about the, um, the native cosmology has really made my place here on earth um, more worthwhile to me and my family. So, so I'm very appreciative of all the work that's gone into this and the knowledge that our elders share and uh, William and Carl and Annette and Jim, you know, just really, uh, um, being a part has helped me in my my life. So, oh, be great. Be great, Jeff. Yeah. Thanks for your good words. Thanks for showing up here and doing our best. Okay, so with that, we'd like to uh, go to um, one of our lead educators, Miss Peterson's class, and I believe they have a question uh, possibly ready for us. Is are we are we ready? Um, let's see, we can't hear you, so we can ask you to unmute. Uh, Annette, also, can you disable the chat, Annette, because I don't have permission to do it. I tried, but I don't know how. Uh, if you look in the Q&A, a couple of people give you instructions on how to do it. And I sent it to you on the on your phone to on how to disable. All right, Annette, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. All right, we're gonna ask our question. Are you guys ready? Yeah, yeah, we're ready. Andrew and I have a question. Why do they offer tobacco? What does that mean? Big witch, thank you for the question. Uh, who wants to take that? Jeff or Jim or anybody? Well, my understanding of the tobacco is um, the tobacco is a gift um, from the creator. And we use that tobacco as a, as a sacrifice to, um, to kind of catch the, um, well, for a couple of reasons. One, if you're um, um, giving the tobacco to take something out of the, the environment, you put that down as a uh, sacrifice that you uh, recognize the importance of what you're doing. But also I think to, um, from what I heard is to kind of catch the creator's ear that what I'm doing here is important to me. And, and, I, and I want you to um, be able to see, you know, that, that I'm doing this and that I recognize the importance of that moment. So that's just my, my own little reason why, but. Jim, you might have something to add. Um, yes, uh, tobacco is one of the four sacred plants of the Ojibwe. And like Jeff has said that um, we honor our elders, uh, plants, animals. Uh, we offer tobacco um, to them as a um, sign of respect and honor that we are either harvesting the plants or harvesting the animals. And so that it's um, respect to the animals and a prayer to the creator. That's really good. Okay, Miigwech. So um, Ms. Peterson's class, did you have one more question or you wanna to wait to the end? We have one more quick question about okay. the <laughs> And Jeff, can you do stop share? So then maybe we can see Ms. Peterson's class on the bigger screen if, if possible. But Okay. Hello, my name is Ada. Sangni was wondering when you use every part of the moose, how do you use the eyes? I think that'd be a question for William. Um, 
unfortunately, I, I mean, to be honest, I used uh, what I could out of the moose, but I, I, I know I probably wasted more than uh, the old timers. And um, like the nose, I know um, that's a delicacy in some, you know, for, for a lot of people, but I, don't, I didn't know how to cook it until I talked with William now. And um, so the next moose I plan on, on, on cooking up the uh, nose and stuff. But um, I don't know about the eyes. That would be a question if, if he could answer sometime here. Okay, we'll see if we can get William on the line. Uh, I'll, I don't know if it'll work, but we'll just give it a quick try. William, are you able to uh, take the good question about how to use the eyes? We can't hear you, you have to unmute. Can you see a button that says unmute? I can hear him talking, but he doesn't have the unmute button off. Um, darn it. So, hold on. Oh, you're muted now, Annette. Um, somebody asked if you could just repeat what he said, if you know. Oh, okay. I I have um, a helper running down to help William, but I think the the idea too is um, there was a soup that was made. I know that I was uh, up in northern Canada. We had moose nose and toes soup, nose and toes soup. So I think that those um, other parts kind of can go into a soup. It would be my guess, and I am just guessing. We do have other Ojibwe elders and knowledge holders that are on this line, like Will Morin, and if uh, if you can help us too, chime in. Uh, also, uh, Carl has shared about making like a mash, like all the extra pieces, like mash it up. Um, I think he called it Cree ice cream or something. Um, so, anyways, okay. I think M M William's on the line. William, can you say something about the use of the eyes of the moose? Oh, the, the only thing is, my grandfather cooked the whole head, huh? His grandfather cooked the whole head. So yeah. why just separate the eyeballs? Just use the whole head. Yeah, that, that's the only thing is, uh, we eat all, everything. Huh? <laughs> they eat every part, everything. So it's yeah. not wasted. Yeah, so was that like a soup, William? Uh, uh no, just... It's like when you roast something as a meat. Roast, roast the whole yeah. head right in the, the fire or the oven or, okay, great. Big, Super yeah. interesting. We're gonna go right to William's video now. William has shared and recorded a video. These videos will be on our resource page for you guys to uh, watch again. Um, William is first language Ojibwe. So um, he does speak sometimes in Ojibwe language. If we have some speakers or folks that are practicing Ojibwe, you'll be happy to hear that woven throughout his presentation. Bonjour, uh, hello. <laughs> I was going to say, but I tried to figure it out all those time. How do you say it? hello in Jibwe? But there is no word in Jibwe. They just meet. What? Well, maybe how? Huh? I don't know. So, so that's what I tried to figure out. Anin is uh, doesn't doesn't say anything, but. Hello and Ani. If you understand Jibwe, all those words, you know what it means. Eh? I was raised traditional way when I grew up. Yeah, there's everything is out there. It's been there for thousands and thousands of years. That's how the old people say. They didn't say we came from someplace else. They never say that. Some people, that's what they say. Over here, I guess they came from someplace else, but but that's what I 
how the old people say. So it will be here for a long time, yeah. And then I first started, they gave me an Indian name. So what they say is, if you understand the word of Mokam, it doesn't say anything about the sun. It says it, it just appeared someplace else. If you, you just came out from some, anywhere, so that's what it means. I learned lots when I was young. They teach me lots. I listen what that word means because you begin to see the word Anjibwa. Who is it this? Sometimes it was hard to speak. I only speak not too long ago. The English, I just learned it. I tried to speak the language of English, but sometimes it's hard to explain it. So I know Anjibwa really, really good, I guess, I don't know. So when you brought up, they teach you a lot of stuff, a lot of things. It's like the moose. That was the, the old, old stories of a moose. You see moose, it's got white legs. They say that's how much snow it's going to be on the ground. <laughs> so all those things. Also, the neck that hangs, they hang it, they cut it off. As soon as they take you, the moose, that, that represents uh, the stars, so they hang it. So the moose is, is always in the, in the stars. The moose, they, they take everything they do and throw away. The ribs, the neck, the head, everything except, except the feet. I guess they use the feet sometimes too. Onishidi, as you call them, because you know all the, the parts, the Indian name of the parts of the moose. The main, the main one is Odisnake. Odisnake, that's the main part of the moose too. That connects everything, the body. So you see moose, it's just a moose, but when you, you know what, the, what that means, everything, and the moose you got. That's when the moose sometimes is fasting to and a fall because it's too busy looking for female, it has no time to eat. So that's when the knock be. After they finish and then they eat. So and then the Dishwamana the Bajraga. Mikinak. Mikinak. What does that mean? We cannot. A road, the road is making the road. That's what you follow. Just like the picture on the turtle on the eye. You see those two people. He's telling this young, young boy to follow the trail. Me cannot. Napping turtle, they call him that. But a long time ago, they used that for medicine men to, when they want to ask something someplace, he goes over there and he comes back and tells, uh, just like if you're looking for a dream, he's going to go check over there what's the name he's looking for. We in the soon, you know? And then, and then he comes. He comes in in the, in the tent, or I guess, Chisikan. Chisikan, I guess. Mamsha, come in snow home after Yasi. I tell him that the picture can't ask you here. Aware that she told me that she had a hand. We have a stone now. But it be a long time you got to be sitting when you're young. They put 10 year old first time before, before he had any kind of sin, <laughs> whatever the sin is. <laughs> they put him for 10 days, and then after that, they just kept him till he's, he's older. When he was young, he doesn't, they don't do that. They don't let him do the, 
So he understands more. That's when he starts start the chant. So also, I was going to say, that's what they did to my great grandmother's two, two twins. They put them on the, uh, on the island for 10 days there. So that's why they became the, doing the, the shaking tent. But some people, they think it's, some, it's really bad, but it's not. It's just uh, when you want to know something, that's, what, that's how it's supposed to work. Looking at is uh, doing the trails as well. It's like he's going to follow that trail and go to the place where if somebody's missing, he's going to go there and go look and then he'll, t- he'll tell the, the people in, inside and then the messenger and then the, the translator is outside and telling the people. He'll mark the roadway where are you going to follow? We can knock. We can. We can is a road. Just follow that, you'll find that person. Or they'll find their way, follow this road. They'll find their way back. Or they okay. So that's what, that's what's supposed to work. Not too much of doctoring, because I know this a long time ago. Because there's some people, the medicine people, they know medicine more than that. It's like a reservation, there's all kinds of different medicine men in there. There's people who know everything up ahead, what's going to be weather, everything. There's some medicine men that are people, there's some medicine men that when a person had a baby, there's a medicine woman in there. I guess what you call that, a midwife, yeah, that's what, yeah. Because I remember my brother was born and after December 26th, about 12 miles away, where we were always we just a small kid. I just still remember. My dad went and get the midwife. It's an old lady. But he had to put him on the sleigh and drag him back 12 miles <laughs> in the winter time. We brought him back over there. Those, those ladies, they don't charge. I mean, there is no charge. It's, you know, it's up to you how much how much you you want to give them. Uh, so that's how it works. Because some people, they know oh, this is what I charge. And some people, that's, that's what they do. but. The medicine people, they, they don't charge, they just, you just have to think how much it's worth what they were doing. So same as me, I had I had a, an old lady there when I was born, he was there. But now, now today they forgot, not too many people like that now. Because those, those ladies here, to be the, the midwife, they had to get it from the spirits uh, because they tell them it's like a measurement is what. They teach them how if the baby's not turning, they want to turn them and uh, so, so, so it's going to come out. And so I was learning everything, not just, not just the medicine, not just the how to learn to talk, <laughs> talk to people. I don't have that much talking to people, but I learned all those, the words of the, figure them out where that means. So it's like I say, anin. Anin is a kind of different word. I understand it. It doesn't mean anything say hello or anything. But I noticed that a long time ago, when they meet some people, they don't say hello or anything. Or, or, or goodbye, I just, they just go. You know, I say goodbye, just like, if you, you're going to see this person last time, huh? that's the only time they say goodbye. I saw the people were a long time ago, so.
Okay, Megwitch William for sharing that about the Mikanak snapping mm -hmm. turtle, making the roadway, the spirit roadway. That's really a beautiful uh, teaching and we're honored that you would share that with us. Um, I think that's a perfect example of how so many times that the in the language, it's a source of knowledge um, for those uh, first language speakers that know the language. They can tell us like that true cultural meaning of the word sometimes is lost in a simple dictionary type translation. So thanks for showing up and sharing that here. Uh, really appreciate it, Migwitch. So we're getting short on time, but I um, have something I wanna share with you and that is our um, NASA content. Um, there's a lot going on and I just wanna mention some important things here. Um, so the NASA moon to Mars is happening. And uh, this is a plan for human beings, the first woman and additional men to make footprints on the moon by 2024. I think this is really important, like this idea of space and going to um, into space, space travel, going to the moon by the year 2024. Think about that. That's like three years away. Also then going to Mars, okay? So this is happening. It's no longer science fiction. We're talking about by the year 2030. So this is NASA moon to Mars. Um, there's also other companies that are involved in this as well as federal space agencies around the world. So this idea of actually human beings going to Mars for the first time, and especially you younger folks out there, you could be signing up to go to Mars, to go to the moon. Think about that. Um, what are the risks? What are the benefits? Are you up for the adventure? Are you willing to leave planet Earth and become a Martian, right? Now think about the travel time. We've got a three-day trip one way to the moon and to Mars. It's going to take you a little bit longer, seven to nine months, okay? So you want to think about that, but you have to wait for the alignment for Earth and Mars to get back. So it's about um, a couple years altogether, at least when you go round trip to Mars. Other things we had to think about is redesigning the toilets. Our toilet bowls in space have been all designed for one gender, one sex men, obviously. So now as more uh, women are going up into space, we had to create just recently um, a new design that was, um, more suitable for women in space. And apparently it's pretty messy when uh, it doesn't all go in the toilet because everything floats. Um, we've got to worry about dust. The moon is very dusty and this dust can cause a lot of problems um, with equipment and spacesuits. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, there's water. And we know that on Earth, where there's water, there is life. And even in the most extreme, maybe I should say, especially in the most extreme, crazy, ridiculous, hostile environments, there is life in the water. Um, sometimes, a lot of times, microscopic, but hey, that's how we believe we started in the primordial oceans on Earth. So there's water. Where's the water on the moon? in the South Pole, in the craters, frozen ice. Where's the water on Mars? In the polar cap on the surface, in the North Polar cap. Otherwise, it's gonna be under the South Pole, the glaciers, um, or underground, not that far underground. It's frozen on Mars, but there is water, lots of water there. We think that long ago, like four billion years ago, Mars looked a lot like Earth. So we also found in 2018 and then confirmed in 2020 that there is um, a lake, an underground lake in the south, underneath the South Glacier Pole on Mars, an under, well, underground lake that's so below the surface. Check it out. Okay, so lastly, um, before we go to our, our students' questions, um, I just wanted to mention the STEM on station, another NASA uh, theme, and we've got the ISS, the International Space Station, orbiting, whizzing around every 93 minutes. They're uh, seeing a lot of lightning hitting the Earth. Um, that's uh, 50 times per second lightning is flashing on the upper atmosphere of the Earth. That's a lot of lightning. 
Um, and also the beautiful Northern Lights as seen from space. The last thing I'm gonna leave you with is this quote by uh, Canadian astronaut, Chris Hadfield. Here we go. I've been around the world 2,650 times or so, and I never once could see enough of it. During my first spacewalk, while I was outside in the dark, we were actually far enough south that we went through the Earth's aurora. It is so fantastically beautiful and such a raw artistic human experience. To look at the Lord and Lights is like magic. To be in them, to surf on them, that's beyond magic. Okay, that's a quote from uh, Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Migwitch, for um, thinking about these incredible things that are happening in science right now. Okay, so we're gonna uh, end our time with the classroom. We've got maybe Lindsay's classroom. Lindsay Marquardt, uh, can, you, uh, can you turn on your sound and, and give us a question or a comment or anything? Uh, Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, I have a student here from the Sanders 10th um, grade physical science class. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's maybe just be uh, louder, but yeah. Okay. She's going to present her, introduce herself and present her question now. Perfect. Miigwech. Bonjour. I am Alex Juan Primo and I am in grade 10 of Sanders physical science. And I was wondering, when astronauts travel to space, why don't they die from the radiation around the Earth? Oh, that's a fantastic question. There's um, a lot of research going on right now about health hazards um, for space travel. So we know that the heart gets smaller, there's less gravity, um, the fluid builds up in the head, it's sort of like this Charlie Brown round face with the, the water building up there. So there's, it's microgravity or a lot, lot, lot less gravity than earth, right? So um, one of the biggest health hazards in space is the, the high energy radiation, which is what your question is talking about. So um, this is uh, the area of research where we're looking for uh, ways to shield astronauts from these uh, high, the high energy um, cosmic rays. So that's, what, uh, that's why they can travel safely right now because it's less time. So if you're just going to the moon, it's only gonna be uh, three days. Uh, travel, but if you're going to the International Space Station, Station, then that's only 250 miles up, so a lot less time. So right now we have materials that we can put on our spacecraft that will shield us um, for shorter times in being in, uh, in the higher energy space radiation. But we have to develop better materials to figure out how to shield and protect people for longer journeys. So that's a fantastic question. Maybe you can help with the, the research. Um, one of the things, just lastly I wanted to say is that the being in space and the, the high energy radiation can actually damage our DNA. So that is something we do not wanna mess with. We wanna be very careful when we talk about these longer nine month journeys like to Mars and beyond. So fantastic, Miigwech. Okay, so uh, Lindsay, did you have another question or we can go to the, the, um, the Q&A from attendees and take a few questions if any of our uh, educators, Jeannie or Lindsay or Melissa, do you have other questions or? One, thank you. Okay. How about let's take a chat, uh, I mean a um, question for from an attendee, does anyone? Okay, well, it's 11.05, um, if we don't, oh. yeah. Um, Annette, they, there was one question, and that question was, um, 
What happened to the Challenger and why did it explode? Um, yeah, the, I only know that it happened in 1986 and it was, uh, fatal. I don't remember all the details there. Um, I know that it was a very deadly accident, 1986. Yes. And I remember the old rings was one of the issues with, the. Uh, with the uh, uh, engines and that's why the the challenger did explode because of the o-rings weren't sealing um you know on that temperature range and then another question is it true the moon is an allergen i don't know what that one means um people can be allergic to the moon <laughs> um, <laughs> i've sure. never, never heard that um but i do know that the word loon uh I mean, moon is connected to, I the, believe, like a Latin word, um, luna. And then that also has other words like um, lunatic and lunacy. And so there has been a, an association with some cultures between um, behave, human behavior and getting exposed to a lot of moonlight. But we do know that the moonlight um, does have an effect on animal behavior. Um, so like um, we uh, have like the, the turtles lay their eggs um, on the land and then they can find their way back to the water. So there is a connection with the moon and animal behavior, um, but may or may not be connections also with human behavior. So um, lastly, I was gonna show everyone if you're interested in the uh, resources, um, you should go to our nativeskywatchers.org, nativeskywatchers.com page. And from the homepage, you can just go to um, the What's New, Ojibwe Astronomy, Moon to Mars. That was today's event. Hopefully it'll come up here. Yep. And then this is every event will have a dedicated web page. So this is the Ojibwe Astronomy and NASA Moon to Mars, which is today. October 23rd. So um, we've got um, the Ojibwe moons for each month. We've got um, the educator resources. So right here, you can download the star map, um, a snapshot of the fall night sky. Let's see if it'll come up. Um, the zoom is a little bit slower on the downloads, but I'll give it a try. Um, you should be able to download this at home without any problems, I hope. And this is a snapshot of the fall night sky. If you want to get the full Ojibwe Gisikanung Masanigan Sky Star Map, you can get that as well on the Native Sky Watchers resource page. So here we have the um, Dewagen, the fall night sky, and there you have the beautiful moose in the south with the winter maker, Baboon Kionini, rising in the east, and the summer stars like Ajijak, um, the Ojibwe crane constellation setting in the west there. The other thing I wanted to point out, we do have some planets that are out right now. So right after sunset or like between eight and 10 o'clock tonight, you could look and see, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. Jupiter is really, really bright, just hanging out there in the Southwest with right next door to like dance partners, uh, Saturn, um, almost as bright as Jupiter. They travel slowly around the sun. So they're just slowly kind of in the same place there hanging out each night. Then we've got Mars right here. Um, and Mars is kind of right after the moose or behind the moose. Um, and uh, that's very red and very bright in the south and east sky right now. The last thing here too is don't forget the Mayingan Makan, which is the wolf's trail. This is the Ojibwe um, word for the path of the sun or the, the scientific name is the ecliptic. And this path is basically um, the shape of our solar system is in that flat pizza-like disc-like shape like this. And so when we look right here, we're looking on along the edge of our solar system. That's the shape of our solar system. So you're only going to see all the, the sun, the moon, and all the planets ever on that same path in the sky. This is the Mayingan Makan, the wolf trail in Ojibwe. 
So um, once you found that, then you could see our booklet that goes with this um, event. And this has a lot of uh, similar resources like you saw in the show today. We've got our team, um, Carl, William, our elders, uh, Jeff and Jim, myself, our educators, Lindsay, Melissa um, and Jeannie, our schools, Alternative School in Cloquet, North Star Duluth Edison Charter School and Net Lake Elementary School in Net Lake, Minnesota, all in Minnesota. So you can see some of the content here in our booklet. Don't forget to look up for the um, Halloween blue moon. Here's the star map and some of the texts along Ojibwe fall night sky. And then some of our exciting um, NASA content. And the last page is um, an, uh, a mention of and contributions in indigenous engineering, indigenous food sovereignty, indigenous housing, and plant medicine. So um, we just wanna say uh, miigwech in our final closing. We really appreciate that you could show up and uh, come to our event. And we all are doing the best we can in a really hard time uh, with COVID. So I um, just wanna say miigwech and palamia, and I hope to see you again on the next event, which is November the 13th, Friday. This will be our Dakota Lakota Astronomy and NASA Moon to Mars Friday, November 13th uh, at the same time, but we'll have uh, Central Central Standard Time, 10 o'clock. Miigwech. Um, I, just before we go, I wanted to thank all the participants. Um, we had several elders who provided some more information about uh, tobacco and the moose. And so I wanted to thank everybody for interacting with us through the questions and the answers. So thank you very much. See you in November. Also, I want to thank Jarita for being the behind the scenes person. Jarita Holbrook, really appreciate you. Everybody, miigwech. <laughs> Big woman. Big woman. <laughs>